Last year, Ridley Scott's Napoleon film came out and it got me thinking about the idea of directors having edits taken out of their hands. The film is said to have a director's cut that lasts for four hours and will be released on Apple TV. Ridley Scott is one of cinema's greatest ever auteurs. There are in films such as Gladiator, Thelma and Louise, Alien and Blade Runner. Zack Snyder famously had his version of the Justice League released in 2021 after a huge push from the general public who wanted to see his vision of the film as opposed to the original flop that the studio released. At the time, and even now, it all seemed quite extreme, the way the studio was hounded into releasing the film. However, over the many years that cinema has existed, there have been several cases of directors going to extremes to protect their films from studio interference. And here are some examples of directors who have pushed the limits. In the early 80s, German mastermind Werner Herzog set upon making the most important film of his career, Fitzgeraldo a biopic about a power-hungry businessman who supervised the transit of a steamship from one treacherous region of Peru to another was doomed from the start when the ambitious German director, who's always preferred authenticity, decided to not work with a ship that weighed 32 tons and that was disassembled upon transit and instead work with a 320-ton ship that would be transported all at once. His stubbornness to adjust the location of the film to a more crew and cast for any location in South America and to shoot in Peru instead while a border war was happening was maybe not the worst decision he made during the shooting of the film because there were many others. Now his decision to do that meant that crew and cast had to live in a makeshift village with only limited food and medical supply for months. Things were not helped by everyone enduring two plane crashes that saw five members of the team injured and another paralyzed. When another crew member was bitten by a poisonous snake they were forced to amputate his leg with a chainsaw. And then cinematographer Thomas Mutch had to undergo hours of improvised surgery of tearing apart his hand and this was without any anesthetics. Herzog, in an attempt to keep spirits high, kept prostitutes amongst the crew. Jason Robots, the wonderful character actor, originally shot a few scenes of the lead in this film but had to drop out due to illness, leading Herzog to hire his regular actor Klaus Kinski to replace him. The actor was notorious over the years for his outrageous behavior. Their last time working together in the Peruvian jungles led to the actor almost shooting Herzog. So it was fair to say that over the years they had a love-hate relationship. Kingsky's volatile behavior and incessant complaining over minor issues made the entire crew hate him. And specifically, the indigenous extras who almost immediately turned the hostility towards him. Herzog later recounted that the chief of the native tribe offered in all seriousness to kill Kingsky for him. And they came afterwards to me and uh, one of their chiefs said to me, you know, um, we were afraid, but don't you believe we were afraid of this screaming madman? They were afraid of me because I was so quiet. Ah, okay. And I, I really meant business. And in, in moments of real confrontation, Kinski understood when I explained to him things very, very calmly, this is impermissible, this cannot be done, what you are trying, there's a task that is beyond the two of us. We have to stick to it or else. And he would know that this or else would mean he would be a dead man within 30 seconds flat. I didn't have to spell it out. You just did, though. Yeah, that's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> the trouble didn't stop there when a neighboring tribe raided the film's camp, leaving one person with an arrow stuck in their neck and another with one in their stomach, requiring up to eight hours of surgery on a kitchen table. But ultimately, the production couldn't avoid death. The tribesmen drowning after borrowing a canoe without permission and others who died from disease. This production was a nightmare, but the film was finished and is seen as a masterpiece today. Since making the film, Herzog has mainly strayed into documentary filmmaking. It was an experience that changed his life forever. Now, Martin Scorsese and Taxi Driver 
are maybe the best examples of a director taking their emotions to the extreme when it comes to a cut of their film. In 1976, Martin Scorsese had just finished work on Taxi Drive and the executives over at Columbia Pictures wanted the filmmaker to recut his masterpiece so the rating would go down from an X to an R. What happened was um, Scorsese had made Taxi Driver and uh, he'd finished it. Marty said, I'm having a big problem. You gotta come look at the last scene. I hadn't, didn't see, hadn't seen any of the movie. He didn't show me the movie. You had me come to the cutting room. Marsha Lucas was cutting with you. And you said, I just wanna show you the shootout at the end. And actually you helped with one of the cuts I was having a problem with. I told Susan Lacey the other day, there was a cut, the guy with the glasses, they got shot. So Marty shows me the sequence, which is with no context, with nothing coming before that scene, I was completely gobsmacked. It was absolutely astonishing. And uh, the MPAA slapped it with an X. And Marty said, okay, I showed it to you because the studio is telling me I have to cut it. He said, what? They're telling me we're going to get an X rating. I've got to cut the scene. Or I've got to cut all the blood out. I've got to cut the fingers coming off when the gun goes off. I've got to cut the overhead shot with all the gore and all the, the long camera that goes all, all the way to where you took the roof off and shot straight yeah. down. And the legend goes that Scorsese stayed up all night drinking, getting drunk with a loaded gun. And so Marty was actually pl plotting murder at that point, and could he get away with it? And his purpose was in the morning he was going to shoot the executive at Columbia for making him cut his masterpiece. I won't mention the person no, you wanted please, to no. kill. Now aptly, moving on to one of Scorsese's best friends, Francis Ford Coppola. And this is maybe the most famous case of a director going completely against the studio. No director in the history of film has had a decade like Francis Ford Coppola did. The Godfather, The Godfather Part Two, The Conversation, Apocalypse Now. And not to mention he wrote the screenplay for the incredible film Patton, which was released in 1970. Each film a masterpiece. And each film could easily be put in the top 20 films of all time. The first of those films, The Godfather, had the director fight in the studios immediately. He had to fight to get Marlon Brando cast, and then famously, he had to fight to get them not to fire his original choice for the role of Michael Corleone, Al Pacino. I wish everybody could have been here and tell the stories about what he went through to make that movie. And every single choice that he made was just like a genius choice and he had to fight for everything. I remember he was talking about how they wanted to fire Pacino and they wanted him out. And he had shot, Francis had shot the early scenes where we're just young and we're kind of, he's kind of insecure and they kept hating him, the, the studio. And so what happened was that Francis being a genius, he said, okay, I'm gonna shoot this one scene, and he shot the scene so that they wouldn't fire Pacino of where Pacino kills the cop. The TV show, The Offer, delves into some of the lengths the director had to go to to make the film into his exact vision. However, at the end of the 70s, with his stock higher than it ever had been, he embarked upon, to date, maybe the craziest film production ever. When he decided to head to the Philippines and shoot Apocalypse Now, much like Fiscarado, the film originally shot with another lead actor. But within weeks of filming, Coppola sacked him. He felt he wasn't quite right for the role. So in came Martin Sheen, an actor determined to prove himself. And by doing so, he pushed his body to the absolute limits, resulting in a heart attack on set. Now, thankfully, as you probably know, Sheen did survive. But much like Herzog's production, Coppola had the cast and crew in the middle of nowhere shooting for 230 days. The film was only meant to take two months originally. Also, it went severely over budget, meaning that Coppola had to personally put his own money into the film to get it finished. There was also a typhoon that wrecked the set early into filming. Marlon Brando, now at a point in his career where really the only thing that mattered to him was money and he would only really do cameos, demanded a huge sum of money to be on set for literally 10 minutes of the film's 147 minute runtime. And to make things worse, he turned up severely overweight with a shaved head, which is why he's shrouded in shadows in all of his scenes. And he didn't know his lines. So he had the crew members say his lines to him before he would say his lines. And he would occasionally just make things up. 
Not to mention that Dennis Hopper, who was notoriously drugged up, and I don't mean just on this set, all the time, went wild into his drug use on this set, demanding cocaine. And if things weren't bad enough, Coppola featured real animal slaughterings in the film, which was, and still is, a major no-no for censorship. And in general, slaughtering animals is a major no-no. Skeletons and bodies in the movie actually turned out to be real. A French plantation and plantation workers cost the film thousands of dollars, but was never even shown in the initial release of the film. And to top it all off, Lawrence Fishburne, or Larry Fishburne, as is credited in the film, was just 14 or 15 during the shoot. So you actually did lie to Coppola? I told them that I was 16 when I had my interview. And you were 14? I was 14. <laughs> I think they knew. I don't think I was fooling anybody, you know. Honestly speaking, had this film gone into production in this day and age, it would have been shut down. And throughout the whole ordeal, the thing that really kept things together but also threatened to bring it all down was a director himself who lost significant weight and begun to doubt himself and the film hugely he even threatened to commit suicide several times during the production one rule that all men from the time they first were walking around looking up at the sun scratching around for food and an animal to kill the first the concept that i feel got into their head was the idea of life and death that the sun went down and the sun went up that the animal the crop when they learned how to make a crop it died in the winter everything died and he to the first man he must have thought oh my god it's the end of the world and then all of a sudden there was spring and everything came alive and it was better i mean after all i mean look at vietnam look at my movie you'll see what i'm talking and after nearly a year in the jungle heart attacks underage actors force majeures crippling budgets script rewrites and copious amounts of alcohol and drug use and misuse apocalypse now was finished. But even then, Coppola wasn't finished, having an iron fist when it came to the final edit, even wanted to not have credits at the end of the film. And the film itself is one of the greatest films ever made. A film that today would never have even have been greenlit. But the question remains, is it worth it for directors to want to have that magical final cut? Well, based on the examples in this video, it maybe is. But really, those examples are outliers and the most famous of such. There are examples of director's cuts of final works being not as good as the original studio cut. The cult classic Donnie Darko left people underwhelmed. So I think it's fair to say that there is no right or wrong here. The thing that does have a common strand running through it is the ability of the director. If the director is first rate, then typically the cut of the film is at worst good and at best a masterpiece. And that is the beauty of film, subjectivity. Now, if you like this video, why not hit the like button and subscribe? It takes a few seconds. And until we speak again, big love.